Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is called the two-minute warning, as they say in football. Uh, so if you'd like to come forward and have a seat up front, you're welcome to do so. If you'd like to stay where you are, if you'd like to grab another little nosh before you get started, if you'd like to freshen up your beverage, whatever it is, you may do so. And we're going to begin in 120 seconds. Let me turn me off. I'm going to turn. Good evening, everybody. My name is David Jolliffe, and I'm the chair of the Tippy McMichael Speakers Committee. And we're just delighted to have you here tonight. What a great turnout. We realize tonight that we are competing with Mozart and Mendelssohn, and we're competing with the Razorbacks. But certainly W.H. Auden can hold his own against both the Razorbacks. Mozart and Mendelssohn, I don't know. It'd be a tough, it'd be a tough one. Um, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to Lowell Grisham in one minute to introduce um, our speaker tonight. But I want to just give you a preview of coming attractions. Uh, you do know that uh, the Tippy McMichael Speaker Series generally brings in two or three people every half of the year. And uh, this is our first event of the first half of 2018. We're delighted you're here to hear Chester Johnson. Um, if you'd mark your calendars, we have two wonderful events coming uh, in the near future. On March 3rd and 4th, I believe these might be in your program, uh, we have a guest coming from, Bright, from the Bright Divinity School at Texas Christian University named Shelley Matthews, who is a wonderful scholar, and she talks about her new work, which is a, a feminist theology of redemption that she's working on. Uh, our parishioner, Doug Cummins, has, knows her well and has recommends her work, so she'll be here on that day. Uh, once again, there'll be a, a reception at 6 o'clock prior to 7 o'clock on Sunday night, and then she'll be with us at the 10 o'clock forum on Sunday morning. And then on April 27th, 28th, is April 1st? Oh, 21st, 22nd, thank you. Uh, Re Reagan Sutterfield will be with us. Reagan came to us on the recommendation of our seminarian, Joshua Daniel, who got to know Reagan when Joshua was in, in seminary. And Reagan is a curate now at a church in Little Rock, but his area looks at the, his research and his writing looks at the connection between food security and the Gospels. And uh, in general, it's sort of an ecological view of the world and how food figures into feeding the people of the world. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that he will be here on Earth Day. So there's kind of a nice little convergence of the, of the situation then. So uh, please do come back. Let folks know about it. We're very, very happy to have all you here at these events. Um, I just always want to emphasize, and Lil urges me to do so, to remember um, the work of Tipping, or the, the, the legacy of Clifton Tipping McMichael. On the back of your program, you find a brief blurb about her life, and particularly about her beneficence uh, to St. Paul's. It was because of the very nice bequest that she left upon her death at St. Paul's that enabled us to establish the endowment that supports this lecture and a number of other outreach activities that we do here at St. Paul's. So uh, as you go home tonight, just say to yourself, gee, I need to remember St. Paul's in my will. And, uh, 
as you're doing so, then maybe there'll be a, a lecture series that has your name on it, or at least to know, to know that, that, you're, that you are thought well of here. And of course, that's a, a bit of hyperbole there, but we're always happy for her support and yours. And then, of course, the other folks that I always want to thank are the wonderful people from the St. Spatulas Guild. So can you please give them a hand? They've done. They do wonderful work, and it's always delicious. So we're delighted to have their food and their sustenance to be with us tonight. And at this point, I'm going to give it to Lowell. So you'll be glad to know he made the announcements. Ah. <laughs> uh, it is wonderful to have Chester Johnson back home. Chester grew up in Monticello, Monticello, Monticello in Arkansas, and uh, has uh, uh, deep roots here in Fayetteville and in Arkansas. We are so glad to have you back, Chester. He is a man who wears many hats, and from time to time a fedora, uh, and uh, tonight his hat is as poet and translator. Now tomorrow he's going to switch hats and, um, and, uh, and talk as an essayist and a historian. Uh, he'll be talking about um, bringing back and raising up to consciousness um, a somewhat forgotten memory, but one that's being enlightened of, a, an, of an extraordinary race riot in Elaine, Arkansas in 1919, and Chester has been key to what we hope will be a, um, a significant centennial event in remembering that um, next year. He'll be talking about that tomorrow. Be here right after the 845 service around 10 o'clock or a little thereafter. Now, one of his other major hats we're going to sort of pass over, but Chester is a very significant and successful financial advisor and consultant. Uh, working with debt management for major cities, for institutions, um, and for states. Uh, and out of his success, he has also had another hat as a, uh, a, a philanthropist and a person of, uh, of a great generosity. And then one last hat I want to mention is, is his public service during the Jimmy Carter administration. Uh, Chester was the assistant deputy to the Secretary of the Treasury. A remarkable life and a wonderful kind of renaissance resume. Um, but my guess is that Chester's first love really is poetry. And reading poetry and writing poetry and studying poetry and talking about poetry. And that's what tonight is. That was the gift he gave to us on his earlier visit when um, he read to us uh, the poem that he wrote uh, coming out of the tragedy of 9-11 as someone who was there on site for the rebuilding efforts and for the rescue efforts uh, at uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, St. Paul's Chapel, our church right at Ground Zero, where so many, including a number of people from St. Paul's, came and found refreshment and found rest, found peace, and uh, found uh, healing. And his wonderful poem, St. Paul's Chapel, if you go to St. Paul's at Ground Zero today, you will find that card in that chapel. Over a million copies have been distributed. Uh, it is the centerpiece of the book that he shared with us his last time, St. Paul's Chapel and other short poems. And he read some exquisite, wonderful short poems and had, had our group enthralled then. Since that time, he has published a book of his longer poetry called Now and Then. And you'll find a copy of that available over here on the, uh, um, at, at the um, book table where Chester will be able to sign and autograph your books, both this book and the book he's talking about tonight, uh, about Auden, uh, the Psalms, and me. And we're getting the author's discount. How long has it been since you bought a new book autographed by the author, author for $10? <laughs> the deal of the century. So stick around and uh, get an autographed copy of, uh, of, of those books. Um, the focus tonight um, will be another set of poems. Um, but these are poems that we all are really, really familiar with. You've got a copy of these poems of, 
of Chester Johnson's. They're in your prayer book. <laughs> and, and I carry around Chester's translation of the Psalms in my, in my uh, iPhone, in my um, electric version of the common prayer book. Chester, at the tender age of 26, was um, put on the prayer book committee uh, to write the Book of Common Prayer that uh, we now have, and he came to take the place of W.H. Auden, one of the most incredible poets of the English language of all time. At the age of 26, Chester replaced W.H. Auden on the prayer book committee and was 25 or so years younger than anybody else on that committee. And what an exquisite gift he gave to us. So he's going to tell some of that story and help us get into that process of translating the wonderful gift of the Psalter that comes to us as Anglicans through Coverdale, through uh, Cranmer, through Auden, and through Chester Johnson. Welcome back to Arkansas, Chester. Told it. There goes green. Okay, there we go. Thank you very, very much, all. Good evening. Good evening. Everybody. I want to express my deep appreciation to St. Paul's for this honor you've given to me as speaker under the Tippy McMichael Lecture Series. I also wish to give special thanks and recognition to Father Lowell Grisham for his friendship over the years and for the generous personal efforts he has lent to projects in which I've been engaged. I wish Kathy and Lowell all the enjoyment and excellent times they envision for their well-deserved retirement. This evening, I will talk about my latest book, Auden, the Psalms, and Me. The story of the retranslation of the Psalms contained in the current Book of Common Prayer. These Episcopal Psalms have become somewhat of a standard. Since considerable background material will need to be covered, I ask that questions be held unto the end, if we may. There is much in my book about the participation by the eminent poet W.H. Auden in the retranslation, and more broadly about his views toward the revision of the entire Book of Common Prayer of 1979. I wish to weave these three elements of the book into a coherent fabric as the story unfolds tonight. Auden, the Psalms, and Me was published in September, and I'm told this book has found an audience among Episcopalians. As way of background, I replaced Auden in 1971 as the poet on the drafting committee upon his decision to return to England to make Oxford his winter home after several decades of living here in the United States. Auden and I communicated through letters even after his decision, and I served as the poet on the drafting committee from 1971 until the final version of our work was published in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer. However, I'd like to start a bit earlier in this story with a short vignette. In 1968, I settled in New York City at the tender age of 23. One Saturday afternoon, soon after my arrival, having secured an apartment and a decent job, I happened to thumb through the prototypical gargantuan phone book employed by telephone users in the city at that time. Oddly, in the listing under the letter A, I happened to stumble, stumble over the name W.H. Auden. Of course, it couldn't be the great Auden. I assumed it was just a duplicate name in a mammoth city. However, for an hour or so, I couldn't leave the obvious prospect alone. Was it possible Auden could actually be at the other end of a mere phone call? At some point, youthful hubris took over, and I dialed a number. Someone picked up the phone, and I began to inquire, is this W.H. Auden? Yes. Is this the poet W.H. Auden? Yes. Oh my, what do I do now? 
The conversation turned into a relaxing discussion about poetry and his verse in particular. The encounter was my first exposure to him as a person. Three years later, when we were both involved in the retranslation of the Psalms project, before he finally withdrew our, from our work, I never once mentioned to him my capricious and solicitous Saturday afternoon phone call. It is fair to say that Auden, in the dusk of his life, had become more than a bit occupied with the threat of revision to his beloved prayer book. For years, he heard rumors rumbling through the Episcopal Church that this revision was under serious consideration. But then in 1967, upon authorizing actions by the Episcopal Church's General Convention, Auden then knew the reality was near, despite his deep reservations about revision. It is crucial to bear in mind as we walk through this story to understand that his misgivings about revision were not the same for the retranslation of the Psalms as they were for the rest of the Book of Common Prayer. Importantly, Auden was too much of a scholar not to recognize that real problems existed with the Psalms carried in the pre-1979 prayer book. There were many mistakes in the Miles Coverdale version of the Psalms. Even such a committed Anglican as C.S. Lewis would say of Coverdale, quote, of course, a sound modern scholar has more Hebrew in his little finger than poor Coverdale had in his whole body. Close quote. To be more specific, the biblical scholar S.R. Driver at the very end of the 19th century stated, the warmest admirers of Coverdale's work must allow that it is disfigured by many inaccuracies. Close quote. So it was well known for generations that the Psalms in the Book of Common Prayer were seriously flawed. In fact, the very first letter I received from Auden on the project acknowledged the need to correct Coverdale's mistranslations. This problem was not new nor surprising. After all, Coverdale knew little Hebrew and had relied on his facility with Greek, Latin, and German to render the Psalms contained in his great Bible of 1540, Psalms that Thomas Cranmer would incorporate <clears throat> for the very first Book of Common Prayer in 1549. Cranmer felt quite comfortable with that Bible at the time and had written the preface to it as the Archbishop, the first Archbishop of Canterbury for the Church of England. Nonetheless, it was known that these mistakes needed to be fixed, and Auden was cognizant of that fact, although he would have a somewhat more narrow approach in the handling of Coverdale than the drafting committee held as a whole. Despite his enormous output, Auden wrote very little about Cranmer, Coverdale, and the Book of Common Prayer prior to 1967. Of course, there were references here and there, such as perfect freedom from the colic for peace that Auden inserted in his poem, New Year Letter. He would also take the line from whom no secrets are hid from the opening sentence of the opening colic of the 1549 communion service and insert the phrase in his poem, Secrets. He obviously carried the memory of lines from his early prayer book and the effect from both of his grandfathers being Anglican clerics. His mother, who influenced Auden more in the ways of the church than his father, was a quite devoted Anglican. And Auden himself had been a devoted choir boy. In the book, A Certain World, he ascribed some of his poetic acumen to the word patterns and phrases gained from his experiences as a young Anglican. Quote, as a choir boy, I had to learn not only to cite, read music, but also to enunciate words clearly and to notice the difference between their metrical values when spoken and when sung, so that long before I took a conscious interest in poetry, I had acquired a certain sensitivity to language which I could not have acquired in any other way." Close quote. So Auden felt he owed a great deal to the artistic language of the Book of Common Prayer. 
that is the ver version buried deep from childhood in his memory banks. By the summer and fall of 1967, he began to turn his attention and enormous talent to the issue at hand, the proposed revision. In October of 1967, Auden gives the inaugural and commemorative T.S. Eliot lectures at the University of Kent in Canterbury. The topic he chooses is Charles Williams' play, Thomas Cranmer of Canterbury. Two excerpts from this lecture indicate the considerable thought Auden was giving to the subject a stir back in the States among Episcopalians. Quote, those of us who are Anglicans, could have said Episcopalians, of course, but those of us who are Anglicans know well that the language of the Book of Common Prayer, its extraordinary beauties of sound and rhythm, can all too e easily tempt us to delight in the sheer sound without thinking about what the words mean or whether we mean them." Close quote. In the second critical excerpt, Auden puts the then current revisionist trend in the context of Thomas Cranmer more than 400 years earlier. Note particularly the word today, quote, Cranmer was a priest and an artist, and like all artistic priests, then and today, he overestimated the spiritual importance of liturgical reform and underestimated the resistance of the laity to it." Close quote. Auden also marshaled his resources for the return to New York City. The following month, back in New York, he attends a worship service at St. Mark's in the Bowery his home parish, at which an experimental liturgy is being conducted by the parish priest. At the conclusion of the service, Auden fires off a smoking four-paragraph letter to the priest dated November the 20th, 1967, characterizing the new liturgy as appalling and emphasizing, I implore you by the bowels of Christ to stick to Cranmer and King James, close quote. <laughs> Later, Edward Mendelssohn, Auden's literary executor and principal biographer, would send me a note and refer to this letter from Auden to his parish priest as the one that started it all. <laughs> Within a month, this letter from Auden made its way to the Standing Liturgical Commission of the National Episcopal Church and to Reverend Canon Charles Gilbert, who at the time was custodian of the Book of Common Prayer vice chairman of the Standing Liturgical Commission, and most particularly relevant, chairman of the Psalter Retranslation Committee. In a letter of response sent a few days before Christmas, Canon Gilbert invites Auden to join the Psalter Committee and proceeds to address in detail each point in Auden's letter to his priest. I won't go through Gilbert's response. However, it is curious to note that Auden immediately replies in a succinct manner, quote, I should be honored and delighted to serve in any capacity on the Standing Liturgical Commission, close quote. This is quite telling. Canon Gilbert had not offered Auden a position on the Standing <laughs> Liturgical Commission. Rather, he had been offered only a place on the Psalter Committee. But Auden knew where the power lay for the Standing Liturgical Commission was responsible for the revision to the entire Book of Common Prayer, and that's where Auden wanted to be heard, not just at the Psalter Committee level, where his views were not so at variance with the membership. Canon Gilbert apparently never discusses with Auden the request to be appointed to the Church's Standing Liturgical Commission. Auden later found that he was not able to attend all of the meetings of the drafting committee for the Psalter retranslation because of his heavy travel schedule. Also, Auden always spent April to October at his summer home in a small town outside of Vienna, Austria. However, these absences allowed Auden to communicate to Canon Gilbert through several amazing letters. I'll quote from one on March 19th, 1968, that is quite remarkable. At least I think so. At the risk of hyperbole, I might even call it revelatory. Quote, we had the providential good fortune, a blessing denied to the Roman Catholics 
that our prayer book was compiled at the ideal historical moment. That is to say, when the English language was already in all its essentials, the language we use now. Nobody has any difficulty understanding Shakespeare's or Cranmer's English, as they have difficulty with Beowulf or Chaucer. At the same time, men in the 16th and 17th centuries still possessed what our own has almost totally lost, a sense for the ceremonial and ritual, both in life and language. Close quote. To douse a bit of cold water on these special words by Auden, I have read the Coverdale Psalms from the document itself, the 1540 Great Bible, and I disagree to some extent with the Auden conclusion about the easy comprehension of writings from the 16th century, at least in terms of Coverdale, without a crib of some sort. Cranmer is one thing, Coverdale another with all its symbols and shorthand language. When considering Auden's responses to Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer and Coverdale's Psalms, it is clear Auden connected ritual and ceremony with great writing. Certainly he associated ritual and ceremony with 16th and 17th century verse and drama, which we may loosely call Elizabethan. Those closest to Auden recognized his predilection for a healthy dose of the ceremonial in his life and work. Christopher Isherwood, a longtime Auden colleague and occasional collaborator, they wrote three plays together, once jokingly remarked that, quote, Auden enjoyed a high Anglican upbringing. He is still much preoccupied with ritual in all its forms. When we collaborate, I have to keep a sharp eye on him or down flop the characters on their knees. If Auden had his way, he would turn every play into a cross between grand opera and high mass. <laughs> Close quote. I don't know if Auden ever worked out any linear or articulate connection between ritual and ceremony and fine writing. But there's no question he believed that the 20th century, with its obvious bent toward informality and lack of ceremony, simply could not compete with 16th and 17th century liturgical writing. In correspondence to Gilbert, Auden lays out his views on what should be done with the retranslation. As a general thesis, be tender to Coverdale, and less is more. For example, Coverdale should be changed only when there is a literal mistranslation. If the word for tomato is translated by Coverdale as pomegranate, then it should be changed. In Psalm 75, verse 6a, the word judgment was correct. Promotion, the word used by Coverdale, wasn't. That was the approach Auden had in mind. But the most controversial position Auden took dealt with Coverdale's elaborations. These were times when Coverdale added language and concepts, probably to fit with his more decorative style, even when the underlying original words didn't support what he did. I'll give an example. In Psalm 90, verse 11b, our retranslation, who rightly fears your indignation. Just to check us, you could look at the Jewish Publication Society's recent version, who can know your furious anger. But here's Coverdale. For even thereafter, as a man feareth, so is thy displeasure. The meaning is different, of course. Coverdale simply added words and concepts through elaboration. Auden didn't seem to mind that. The committee did, and most other modern translations did too. Another example, Psalm 74, verse 5a, our version. They were like men coming up with axes to a grove of trees. Coverdale. He that hewed timber of four out of the thick trees was known to bring it to an excellent work. <laughs> Altered meaning. Auden and the committee differed on some fundamental issues, but it was a matter of degree, not in absolutes. The committee wished to maintain Coverdale as much as it could legitimately do so. Gilbert would later write, quote, a revision in the spirit of Coverdale was the guiding principle of the committee, 
whether in the removal of obsolete and archa archaic words and expressions, or in the emendation of manifestly inaccurate renderings or forms. Dr. Marion Hatchett, the Episcopal liturgist and writer, went so far as to say in his recent commentary on the American Prayer Book that our version of the Psalter, quote, is limited for the most part to that used by Coverdale in the 16th century, close quote. Auden probably would have disagreed with that characterization, and the committee may have disagreed with it as well, but for entirely different reasons. Auden served as a member of the committee from 1968 until 1971, at which point he made the decision to return to England. Auden lived only a little over a year after leaving New York City. I was appointed to replace him in 1971, but we exchanged correspondence about the retranslation project. Mostly his letters were perfunctory. However, soon after my appointment, the Poetry Center at the 92nd Street Y, which is still a major spot for honoring verse in New York City, asked in the spring of that year if I could put a program together on the status of our retranslation. In turn, I sent a notice to all committee members about the event. Auden responded he couldn't make it, but added a rather strong message that he was so disturbed by the revisions to the Book of Common Prayer that he was now forced to attend a Russian Orthodox church. <laughs> a few weeks later, I received another letter from W.H. Auden, which I learned was his last communication to the committee, his valediction, as it were. I often wondered why he chose to send it to me, but I've determined he had two reasons. One, he surmised I would be on the committee until the Psalter retranslation was complete. He was correct. Second, since I was at that time by far the youngest on the committee, he thought I would be around the longest. <laughs> so his views about the revision of the Book of Common Prayer could be known in the future. In this letter, Auden expends only a few words on the Psalms. The letter consists of several paragraphs. Still, you should hear its entirety. His reference to the rite, R-I-T-E, meant the Eucharist, communion. Dear Mr. Johnson, thank you for your letter. What has happened over the last few years has made me realize that those who rioted when Cranmer introduced a vernacular liturgy were right. When this reform nonsense started, what we should have done is the exact opposite of the Roman Catholics. We should have said, henceforth, we will have the Book of Common Prayer in Latin. There happens to be an excellent translation. In my view, the right, preaching of course, is another matter, is the link between the dead and the unborn. This calls for a timeless language which in practice means a dead language. My own parish church has gone so crazy that I have to go to the Russian Orthodox Church where, thank God, though I know what is going on, I don't understand a single word. <laughs> The odd thing about the liturgical reform movement is that it is not asked for by the laity. They dislike it. It is a fad of a few crazy priests. If they imagine that their hijinks will bring youth into the churches, they are very much mistaken. As for the Psalms, they are poems. And to get poetry, it should, of course, be read in the language in which it was written. I myself, alas, know no Hebrew. All I know is that Coverdale reads like poetry and the modern versions don't. Lastly, I don't believe there is such an animal as 20th century man. With best wishes, yours sincerely, W.H. Auden. I'd like to underscore the final full sentence. Lastly, I don't believe there is such an animal as 20th century man. We'll get back to that momentarily. There's a whole chapter in my, in my book on this letter. I discuss the language and concepts he borrowed from the English writer Charles Williams, who was theologically a major influence on Auden, whom Auden called one of only two saints he had ever known. I also describe in that chapter the fact that Thomas Cranmer, as a Reformationist, would have disagreed with Auden about both the return to Latin and the participatory role of the dead at communion. We don't have time to discuss or to focus on those issues, 
But if you acquire the book, I believe this letter of July the 6th, 1971 will be something upon which you will wish to spend a little time. If you are interested in Auden's specific contributions to the retranslation, here are places to look. In Psalm 27, Auden substituted secrecy for secret places. In Psalm 42, Auden changed Coverdale's water pipes to cataracts. And in Psalm 95, he replaced prepared with molded. Of course, he argued sharply for the retention of much inherited language. I'm aware Auden fought for the preservation of this line from Psalm 122, Jerusalem is built as a city that is at unity in itself. With only one minor prepositional amendment, that is precisely the way the line now reads in the current Book of Common Prayer. There were other similar victories for him, no doubt. Based on my comments so far, one could easily conclude that Auden had been a voice in the wilderness. However, many of us know Episcopalian, knew Episcopalians at that time who were willing to fight to the bitter end for their unrevised Book of Common Prayer, including in particular the unretranslated version of Coverdale's Psalms, Coverdale's Psalms of the 1540 Great English Bible. This loyalty to Coverdale by Anglicans went back for many generations. In recognition of Coverdale's style for graceful and canorous lines, there is an apocryphal story about Coverdale, the Psalter, and Shakespeare that deserves mention here. This story is known to have been repeated over multiple generations. It goes like this. As Coverdale was retranslating the Psalter in the 16th century, he would visit a certain pub each night, the same pub then frequented by Shakespeare. So whenever Coverdale ran into a problem rendering a difficult passage into English, he would simply ask Shakespeare his opinion over a glass of malt, wine, or whatever they were drinking at the time. In this story, Shakespeare was actually responsible for key parts of the Coverdale version of the Psalter. However, the dates don't work. Shakespeare was only four when Coverdale died. <laughs> and the geography doesn't work. Coverdale apparently did much of his work on the Psalter while he lived on the continent in exile. Thus, the story is only apocryphal. But still, it has had its particular message over time. Keep your hands off of Coverdale if you know what's good for the congregants of the Anglican Episcopal Church. <laughs> we'll return to Auden one last time at the end. Now I'd like to turn away from him for just a few minutes and talk about the work of the committee. The composition of the committee ranged from time to time between seven and nine members. There were several Old Testament scholars with considerable knowledge of the underlying languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. One member had previously served on a committee for the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And the chairman, Canon Charles Gilbert, who was the heart and soul of the committee, always produced the first draft of every psalm we considered. He had facility in each of the underlying languages. There was a poet, of course, and because the psalms are used responsively and for chanting in Episcopal churches, a musicologist attended virtually all meetings, which occurred semi-annually for more than a decade in New York City, and each time lasted for several days. We worked independently between meetings. Auden and I never attended the same sessions. When I first became a member at the age of 26, some 20 years younger than the next youngest member, I felt a little like a mascot, but, but then I quickly did something Auden hadn't done. I developed a compilation, a spreadsheet, if you will, on the ways that certain recent and respected translations, I chose about eight versions, had rendered the lines for Psalms we were then reviewing. I produced this information so the committee could get a sense of the variation among those versions in poetic style and poetic results. I believe the compilation sensitized members to the various poetic possibilities for each line of the Psalms. It also improved the discussion about the quality of language since the differing versions were right in front of each committee member. It certainly assisted us for those sections of the Psalms that were not just an update of the Coverdale language. 
in those instances where it was clear Coverdale hadn't achieved the correct retranslation. In a citation from the Standing Liturgical Commission I received in 1979 for my role on the committee, this was an area given specific note in addition to my poetic contributions. For the advertisement of Auden the Psalms and me, church publishing refers to the 1979 Episcopal Psalms as a standard, primarily as a result of the acceptance our Psalms have received. Soon after we completed our work, Lutherans in the United States and Canada adopted our Psalms for service and worship, initially in the Lutheran Book of Worship, but also by, for the subsequent Evangelical Lutheran worship although the latter enlisted the Episcopal Psalms in a somewhat adjusted fashion. While the Lutheran Book of Worship adopted our Psalms as they were, the Evangelical Lutheran Worship employed them as a primary source and foundation, meaning our Psalms were accepted as they were written in certain places, but not in all. The Anglican Church of Canada also adopted our retranslation. Regarding the adoption of our version by the Canadian Anglicans, one feature of our psalms that needs a little exp explanation consists of our attempt to achieve gender neutrality. Canon Gilbert described it this way in 1978, quote, The psalmists were given to the use of men and children or sons of men and similar terms where, from the context, it is quite clear that those referred to were neither exclusively masculine in gender nor singular in number. Some of the passages deal with our common humanity. Others are plainly collectives. Still others are speaking of our human mortality." Close quote. In adopting our version, the Anglican Church of Canada did not believe we were wholly successful in achieving gender inclusion. Quote, the Psalter which appears in the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church USA has been selected. It was chosen because of the verbal accuracy of its translation, because the form is familiar and highly suitable for use with both plain song and Anglican chant, and because the translators made an earnest, although not always successful, attempt to use gender-inclusive language whenever possible. This is a good translation, recognizably Anglican in flavor." Close quote. The Episcopal Psalter was also adopted as the preferred psalm translation until the Church of England produced in 2000 its own version, Common Worship, Services and Prayers for the Church of England. The Right Reverend David Stancliffe, who held the position of Chairman of the Church of England's Liturgical Commission from 1993 until 2005, during which time Common Worship was developed, and who is acknowledged as a Chief Architect of the Revised Version of the Psalms for the Church of England, wrote to me in 2014 and said the following, Quote, we set about exploring alternatives. We certainly considered the Episcopal Psalter, and I had experience with it both in the United States and in certain religious communities in this country which had used it in preference to any other. This led to the adoption of your Psalter as the preferred psalm translation in celebrating common prayer, the pioneer in reforming the structure and style of the daily office. Close quote. One can debate whether Episcopal Psalms have become a standard or not, but upon reflection, I don't think any of our revised verses have come back to bite us, unlike some other translations. For example, there's one line in Psalm 50 from a recent version I'm sure the translators have wished on more than one occasion to recall. We rendered the line as, I will take no bull calf from your stalls. <laughs> Innocent enough. However, the other well-known Bible, which apparently paid less attention to vernacular speech, translates the same line as, I will accept no bull from your house. <laughs> In current everyday speech, the latter rendition is hardly the meaning. <laughs> Clergy and lay folks in the Episcopal Church have occasionally asked me to recite for them the principles that the drafting committee followed for the retranslation. I'll mention the main ones briefly. Others existed, but these were the most salient. There would be a change when we found a mistranslation. There would be a change where a word or phrase had become obsolete. The contemporary second person pronoun forms would be used even when addressing God. 
O in the vocative form and OH as an exclamation would conform to contemporary usage. However, O as cohortative, such as O come, let us worship, would be regarded as obsolete. A decision was made to print Lord in all capitals when rendering the divine name Yahweh or Jehovah and Lord with only an initial cap L when translating the word Adonai. The Hebrew form of Alleluia was reinstated while the Latin form of Alleluia and the English equivalent praise the Lord were excluded. We also decided to print the Psalter as poetry. One final point. The committee determined early it wouldn't just look at the Hebrew to English and determine whether Coverdale got it right or not. There was an effort to track the way we, Anglicans and Episcopalians, received the text. Were there mistranslations along the way from Hebrew to Greek into the Septuagint, or mistranslations from the Septuagint into St. Jerome into the Vulgate to make a conclusion how those translations or retranslations had impacted the received text? After all, we Anglicans and Episcopalians had received the Psalms through a circuitous route and that journey should be considered. As we're winding down, just a few final comments about the person Miles Coverdale. If you go to Lambeth Palace in London, where the first Book of Common Prayer was compiled, your tour guide will show you a picture of Coverdale. However, if you study the history and background of Coverdale, you'll discover there is no authenticated portrait of the man. In fact, we know relatively little about him unlike Thomas Cranmer. He did live into his 80s. We also know that Coverdale would have been burned at the stake for his great Bible and Reformationist attitudes when Queen Mary came into power, but for the intervention of the King of Denmark. He was in exile more than once on the European continent where he did much of his work, particularly on the Psalms. He contracted the plague, but survived. Although at one point he was a bishop, he soon lost the position to concentrate on his translations. Coverdale had strong connections to Thomas Cromwell and Sir Thomas More, and Cranmer thought highly of his work. He was also godfather to a child of the founder of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, John Knox. Coverdale was an extraordinary man who has deeply influenced not only congregations, but also the English language going on 500 years. There's much more about Coverdale and Auden the Psalms than me. In conclusion, when W.H. Auden penned to me the message, I don't believe there is such an animal as 20th century man, I initially thought of it as a throwaway line in the context of the letter he had written. Later I realized upon rereading and giving his comments further thought and amplification that the words had in fact summarized emphatically both his literary and theological views about a critical issue. The original psalmist, Coverdale, Auden, and the committee all shared a commonality that could not meaningfully be disrupted. For the words of the psalmist and their thoughts, pains, and humanity conveyed the aspirations, personal disappointments, happiness, and unhappiness of Coverdale and Auden, all of us, who happened to be walking around at various points along the continuum of time. We're somehow the same, regardless of the moment in which we find ourselves alive, which may range from the hell of the Holocaust to convivial peace passing our way from hour to hour. Through the seeming simulacrum of acute throwaway line, Auden had, however, found in the Eucharist the dead and the unborn linked and found in Latin the language of the dead, but also of the faithful. And where he chose to plumb the depths of the immutable, unchallenged question of time and eternity in his Christmas oratorio for the time being. In ironic way, the final product of the committee fulfilled the proposition Auden broached. We took the words of poems written 2,500 to 3,000 years ago, collected them unchanged in personality or character, dressed them in a modern and postmodern garb, and had them sing in the lilted, lilts and sonorities we inherited from the 16th century of Miles Coverdale. Our traversing and coalescing a sort of timelessness where Auden meets the poets of the Psalms and all voices convene in a timeless engagement. Whether he knew it or not, 
the Episcopal Psalter did become in its final form and edification a sort of unambiguous and tailored homage to Auden's credo that I don't think there's such an animal as 20th century man. Thank you. We're going to do questions. Let me grab a mic here. Oh, okay. I think we do have a few minutes for questions. And at St. Paul's, we tape everything for an archive so that if you do ask a question, don't go like this, don't go like this, don't go like this. Go right, talk right in the microphone if you would, please, because we're putting it on the archive. So uh, if you have a question, let me know. I'll bring the microphone to you, and you'll speak right into it. As you were speaking, I was thinking of the old saw that the Americans and the English are two peoples divided by a common language. Um, do you think that Episcopalians are a people divided by a book of common prayer? I actually don't. Um, I know there's, there are discussions about it. And there's, you know, there are discussions now about a new book of common prayer. Um, but I, I don't see it as a, an, an element of divisiveness that um, is part of our, I think, it's, I think it's more, it's seen as a supplement to the normal worship during the course of time and that everyone has a different view on it. I don't necessarily see it being significantly divisive. Now, in the late, uh, 70s and in 80s, um, it, it served that purpose for a lot of people. I mean, there were you know there were a number of, of parishes that left the church, and um, there were dioceses who that took positions like that. But I think that everyone sort of, and and also the other point I would make is I think that the Book of Common Prayer gives the options that. Could otherwise, if if right two became so codified that um, that it was heretical to use right one, I think you'd probably find that to be the case. The flexibility that's allowed in the Book of Common Prayer to use right one, right two, and you know there are even outer space stuff that's included in them. And so, uh, but the flexibility that's allowed, I don't think causes that kind of division. There's more. Coming right to you, Laura. I'm fresh off of reading Robert Alter's translation of the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And one of the lines that stood out that's so different from the English is in the 23rd Psalm. We're very familiar with, Lo, through I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And he has that as, I think it's through death's dark veil. Because there's only four syllables in the Hebrew, and he wanted the English to mimic the Hebrew. So my question is... How, when it came to language, did the committee want, really want the Psalms to meet the expectations of readers of English poetry, or did they ever try at all to imitate syllable length or line length or cadence of, of Hebrew at all? Um, yes and no. I mean, it's, it's clear that the English language has expanded what was available in Hebrew. I mean, Hebrew had, you know, the, each line had maybe two or three strike marks or um, emphasis. The English language has expanded that, where lines are, you know, it, it, most of the uh, American English ears expect a line not to be truncated after one or two uh, strong syllables occur, notwithstanding you have haikus and stuff like that. But they, and so, but as a as a matter of course, and we talked about this a lot in the committee, as to, um, and obviously Coverdale had had some thoughts about it because his lines are so much long were so much longer than ours. But we we tried to accommodate the fact that the English the English and American ear does expect longer lines in terms of the way in which they're accented and unaccented. Um, so, and, and I have a great deal of respect for Alter, 
work. Um, and, uh, but, but, and I understand what he's doing, but I think for particularly to look at the way in which Episcopalians or Anglicans use um, the Psalms in terms of chanting and um, Anglican chant or plain song or whatever, um, and also responsive. It would become, I mean, you think about if we had only two or three accented syllables on, it would be, for responsive, it would, it would be a little awkward. And, um, so, and we talked about that. So I think we tried to accommodate sort of the historically derivative or derived ear of the English-American uh, in, in the length of our lines that we determine. Does that sound right? Any other questions? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Pardon me. As a poet, we know that Auden was amazingly adroit at uh, various metrical and prosodic uh, variations. Did you, how did that expertise affect his contribution to the revised Psalter, in your view? Well, um, you know, the thing is that Auden's participation um, was based on, in part, on a larger sense of what the Book of Common Prayer meant. And he would, you know, he would make comments like, um, oh, even away from the Psalms, he would say, you know, that the quick and the dead, we should, you should never, that that's just bad poetry to make it the living and the dead because it's supposed to be like monosyllabic and, and as opposed to breaking out with a living of, you know. And then he, uh, then he would complain about, um, um, the prayers that, you know, he wanted to see I believe as opposed to we believe. He said, you know, prayer is single, it's not a mob. And when you use the word we, it's more like a mob than being single. So he looked at the, I, you know, Auden made enormous contributions because what he did is he, he kept the committee and he kept in sort of a narrow band to make sure that the group didn't go haywire or move so dramatically in one direction. But as, as far as bringing technical expertise, I think it was very limited. Um, because the larger overarching issues that he addressed weren't on the basis of whether, you know, how he would... You know, Auden said that there's probably not a form of the English language, the poetic language that he hadn't written in. And so you're right. I mean, he, you know, he had that kind of capability. But that's not where he struck. That's why he used that, you know, when he got back to Canon Gilbert, and he said, I'd be delighted to serve in any capacity on the Standing on Liturgical Commission. That's where his interest was. Interest wasn't, I, I mean, he made contributions to the Psalter Committee, but that's really not where his interest fell. It was more in the, the global sense of it. I have uh, two questions. We use the St. Helena Psalter in our liturgy here. Question one, um, are there major differences between that uh, St. Helena and your 1979 effort? And number two, is Auden's influence discernible in the St. Helena Psalter? Um, yes, there's quite a bit, and if I may explain what the differences are, um, and, and I, I've tried to um, clarify it a bit in my remarks, and that is that we tried to do gender-inclusive language as much as we could, because we know that there are places where um, man is meant generally to include everyone. It's not man as um, gender or, or sex or whatever. Um, what I think St. Helena did, and I don't want, but that there was such a momentum to create a gender inclusive nature of it that 
in those instances where it is even, it's very clear that the intent was a male, that they still made it gender neutral. And, um, and I'm not making any judgment. I mean, people get what they get, and they set up their own rules and go about it in their own way. Our, our decision was try to be as faithful to the language as we could, the underlying language, but bear in mind that when it, it will, the intent from our perspectives was, were meant, uh, the intent from our, was meant to be more general in nature to, to include gender inclusive language for that, but not at every moment, every line. And then the other thing is, um, um, I gave, you know, I previously talked about Auden's participation, and I really don't think um, if, um, I don't think Auden is recognized necessarily except where he made those, where he's made changes throughout. Where he, and he made more changes than what I identified. I think most of his changes had to do with the retention of Coverdale as opposed to new language. Um, and that had an important, um, that contributed a lot because it made all of us, I mean even there were, time, there were times after I completed it, I would be sitting back contemplating, I said, well, maybe we should have kept a little bit more in this line than the other. And why? Because I was hearing the echoes of Auden in my, my, my memory banks. One of the things I'm so grateful for is that the uh, uh, 79 prayer book kept that wonderful tradition of the daily office so central to Anglican practice and uh, kept the Psalter um, right as the centerpiece of the daily office. Uh, and uh, lots of people here do that every day and you just, you, you, you live in the Psalms and they, they, they just get into your body and into your mind and into your soul. And for me, that's been particularly important in those um, periods in American history when I have had problems with, say, um, elected officials or the general ethos of the way the country's going. And the raw passion and feelings and anger and fury and violence that is evidenced in the Psalms, um, I need those words. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what kind of conversation did y'all have about those uh, nasty passages in the Psalms <laughs> that express the dark side of the human condition? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, you, what happened actually, I'm going to do an advertisement because uh, tomorrow for 8.45 and 11, I'm actually going to be talking about why were, the, why were the Psalms poems. And it goes to that very issue. I'm, I, I, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll give you my response now, but, but you know, it just, it departed so, Psalms departed so extraordinarily from the Old Testament, and I mean, Old Testament excluding the Psalms, and certainly the New Testament, where it's there's a logic, there's a cataclysm, there's a um, the poems are meant to be outrageous in some respects, and they're supposed to be um, emotional, incisive, and um, energetic, and not even be truthful in some. I mean, I, I mean, yes. It's generally, but I mean, emotionally, it's truthful, or they should be. But um, there was a lot, there wasn't, I think the committee knew that the Psalms were different from other parts of the Bible in that very way. And that they're not supposed, as you know, some denominations have actually excluded parts of the Psalms because they find, find them to be outrageous or they're nativist or gratuitously violent and all that kind of stuff. And my view is, you know, 
That's the way people respond. That's the way, I mean, you take 137, for example, uh, you know, where they've been, uh, the, the Jews, have, the Hebrews have been taken from Judea and Jerusalem, and they're, they're going, they've been taken on this long, forced march to Babylon, and their, their conveyors say, you know, t sing to us one of the songs of Zion, and say, well, we can't do it, we can't do it. We, how do we sing um, a song of God in an alien land? But then the rest of the psalm where, you know, but in their minds and in their being, they're saying, we're going to get back to you, and blessed are those who, you know, crash the, 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 the skull of the young against a rock. I mean, that's pretty tough stuff. But, and I'm, but I mean, that, I think we knew. We had to respond to it, and, and uh, to, uh, to the emotionalism of the Psalms being completely different from the rest of it and being in, important to the core of what the Bible is. Um, and, and also Charles Gilbert, I won't make that point. Charles Gilbert um, had a real strong poetic strain to him. He had, um, uh, when he was in college, he, had, uh, he went to the University of Chicago and he was very involved in po po uh, poetic groups and, and that sort of thing. And I think one of the reasons that he, that he pointed me is he thought that I would, I was young, uh, foolish, and, and all the rest, but I was um, really into it. And I think that he was concerned that, that the scholars were going to make this more literal than what the Psalms should have been. And I think he reckoned, and Auden hadn't really done that. I mean, Auden had, complained about, as I said, I mean, he had the big picture. So no one had really gotten into it to fight for what the Psalms really represent, which they're poems. And uh, I thought, he, I think he thought I would do it, and that he, even though, you know, there were generations, we were generations apart, that he thought I would be a workhorse on in working with him to do that. And Charles and I became very close. I won't go into it, but I mean, we, we 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 were very close, and um, during that time, and he was, but he he was um, he had the spirit of a poet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say I was, but but he yeah, that's the way he he felt about it. <laughs> we have reached right to eight o'clock. We've been we've had Dennis or Dennis. We've had Dennis there. Uh, Chester up there for an hour. Um, I'm sure I Chester, don't mind. Uh, anyone has any more I'm questions? I'm sure Chester would be happy to, to hang around, answer your questions, sign your books. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I'd delight to have you here tonight. Thank you. Thank, thanks to Chester. And again, uh, just a little bit of advertisement. Tomorrow, he, right in this same location at 10 a.m., uh, Chester will be talking about his new work to create a memorial reflecting upon the race riot in Elaine, Arkansas in 1919, a bit of new work, a fascinating bit of Arkansas history. And he will be preaching at the 845 and 11 services tomorrow, so be here. Thank you.